Good afternoon. How are you? Happy first day of cardiovascular. Holy cow. So this, dis this is a group of disorders that kills more women than anything else in the world, right? And also more men than any other disease in the world. And uh, we seem to be importing it all over the globe. Uh, Americans are metastasizing fast food to all cultures in the planet. And cardiovascular disease and diabetes seem to follow fast food. It's amazing. But that's not my topic for today. Uh, today we're going to talk about the electrocardiogram. It's ironic that a test that was developed 100 years ago is still so critical in the evaluation and management of patients. Okay? So in the next hour and a half, I'm going to try to help you understand the basis for electrocardiography. This will be a good preload to discussions we have tomorrow morning about coronary heart disease. And of course, it'll be the prelude to all of the stuff on arrhythmias. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do as faculty is disclose to you all relationships that we have with financial entities. Um, as far as I know, none of these relationships will unduly bias what I say. But if you find bias, please let me know, OK? And if you find people who want to fund folks like me, please also let me know that, <laughs> OK? Um, so our objectives today are here. We're going to learn the nomenclature and classification for ECG interpretation. We'll talk about some of the major conduction abnormalities that you're going to see patients who have electrical problems. We're going to introduce you to ischemic heart disease patterns of EKG reading. And a couple comments about how structural heart disease affects the electrical activation of your heart. I should say that Lily is very good in this area. I think it's an excellent chapter. You'll see that my slides follow very closely with Lily. Uh, however, if you find that um, I'm confusing you at any time, raise your hand. Or you can email me after, keagle at umich.edu. Any questions, feel free to email me. OK. So we're going to talk about the normal EKG, the electrical uh, measurement. We're going to think about this as a single cell. Then we'll go to ECG reference systems and then how we interpret EKGs. Uh, ECG, EKG, it depends. If you're German, it's EKG, electrocardiogram. And if you're not German, it's electrocardiogram, ECG. Doesn't matter. OK. So key concepts. We're going to talk about the resting electrical cell is polarized. And we're going to talk about the depolarization process that leads to an electrical signal being passed, how it resets itself, and then the concept of directionality. So you're looking at a cardiac cell uh, in its resting state, and it is electrically depolarized. It has ion channels in the membrane that create relatively negative electrical force inside the cell and positivity outside the cell. And for purposes of convention, let's say we're going to measure electrical activation in this cell. Well, we're going to need a reference frame, right? So let's say we'll, we'll have this be our negative electrode, and this will be our positive electrode. And we're watching what's happening with electrical change. And this cell is just sitting here in a depolarized state. If we capture this on an EKG machine, it looks just like a flat line. Obviously, this is what you see on ER. When the heart stops electrical activity, there's a flat line. Everything is either polarized or repolarized, but it's not changing. So here's a cell that's in its resting state. It's flat line. And then let's say this cell receives a stimulus from a neighbor cell. And this stimulates the membranes to switch. These ion channels are allowing positive ions in. And the cell is becoming depolarized. It's polarized here, and now it's going to be depolarized. If we measure 
what's happening in the cell membrane from our orientation over here, the positive electrode. Depolarization that's coming toward us is represented on an EKG as an upward deflection. Okay? So if it's coming toward us, the forces look upward on the EKG paper. If it's going away, it's going to be down. So here's what's happening. The cell is depolarizing from the point of introduction and it's moving in this direction and you see it's creating a positive force on this EKG paper. <laughs> when it is completely finished, the cell has become depolarized and this returns to baseline because there's no more change. Right? We're measuring change with our electrode. So the cell has depolarized completely. This comes back to the resting state and here we are. If we watch this phenomenon from the positive electrode, positive force, if, it is, if we're watching it from, a, from the other side, it's going to look like a negative wave. Okay? So this introduces the concept of a polarized depolarization and directionality of the EKG forces. And the concept also that when you see movement in the paper, it's change. It's measuring change in electrical activity. Now, when the cell repolarizes, you see this area of the cell is recovering its original state. Ion channels are pumping these positive ions out, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and the cell is becoming repolarized again. If, if this moves in the direction of a positive electrode, we actually see a negative deflection Depolarization toward an electrode, positive wave. Repolarization, negative wave. And you say, well, why is, why, why is that? By convention, Eindhoven and those who discovered electrocardiography decided if I'm watching an electrical impulse from a positive pole, I'm going to make it a positive wave on my EKG. You could reverse it if you wanted. And repolarization is going to be a negative wave. Okay? Pretty simple, but if you start connecting all of these cells together, it's far more complicated. So the cell is repolarizing, and when it's done, we have, you see it's changing, there's negative deflection here because the cell is repolarizing, and when it comes back to a resting state, it's flat again. The cell has completely repolarized. Depolarization, repolarization. All of you are sitting there, and every second or so, your cells are depolarizing. And then they're re if you're lucky, they're repolarizing. Can you hear it? That's amazing. So why does an EKG look like this? Here's a QRS complex. This is the major electrical activity of the ventricles. And here's the T wave, which is the recovery of the ventricles. You say, wait a minute, you just told me that it's going to repolarize in the reverse direction. That you're going to see a negative wave, right? What's very interesting is the way our hearts regroup, repolarize, in, so if the, if the cell depolarizes in this direction, it actually repolarizes in that direction. So it, the, both waves end up looking positive in most leads. If it's positive in one lead, it's going to also have a positive recovery because the electrical stimulus goes out and it comes back in the same order. So most commonly, most EKG leads that you're going to see if the QRS complex is upward, the T wave is also upward. This is the cell depolarizing. It's the electrical equivalent of myocardial contraction, isn't it? And this is the electrical equivalent of myocardial relaxation. Right? Okay. So then, 
how do we actually measure what's going on in your heart or my heart electrically? We need leads that tell us what's the orientation and magnitude of the activation of our heart. Now we use, we use different kinds of leads to create an electrocardiogram. They are unipolar leads, bipolar leads, and chest leads. Okay? Uh, where were chest leads invented? Right where you're sitting. Yeah, Frank Wilson was an electrical engineer at the University of Michigan. And a physician uh, recognized this kid had talent, said, you know, you ought to go to medical school. So he did. And then he stayed here and he invented the chest lead system of the EKG. All the 12 lead EKG done around the world today had its origins uh, at your medical school. And Frank Wilson was the guy along with a lot of other people. So let's look at this. Right arm electrode, left arm electrode, chest electrodes, right leg electrode, left leg electrode. We're going to have, what, one, two, three, four electrodes on the heart. These are going to be measuring electrical activity. And we're going to have six of them on the chest. Here's the sternum. So V1, V2, V3, 4, 5, and 6. This will be in the mid-axillary line. Okay? And this is going to be up uh, in the second or third inner space. Okay? So these are the V leads, and these electrodes, the limb electrodes, will be used to create the non-chest lead impressions of the EKG. All right, so let's look at the unipolar leads. AVR, there, there's some central place here in your upper abdomen or chest where the sum of the electrical forces is relatively zero. It's, it's kind of the central terminal. And what we could do is we can put an, electric, an electrode on your right arm and we can measure directionality of your EKG from this angle. Okay? That's AVR. We could also put one on your left leg and measure whatever is happening in this direction. We'll call that ADF. Okay? We could also put one on the left arm, and we'll call that AVL. Each of those points of orientation is watching the electrical activity from a different angle. And from those different points of view, we begin to get a picture, a mosaic, of what the electrical activation and then repolarization of the heart looks like. Well, those are the unipolar limb leads. We can also use two leads to create an orientation. Here's one where we put the negative electrode on the right arm and the positive is on the left arm. That's called lead one. Here's one where the negative is on the right arm and the other is on the left leg, lead two. Here's the left arm is the negative electrode positive electrode is on the leg, that's lead three. I didn't invent why they call these things this way. You know, we can't go back and ask Eindhoven, what was he thinking? But this is by convention, these are the six unipolar leads, basically, or the unipolar and bipolar. They're all looking at the EKG in a single plane this way. Okay? So, Unipolar, AVR, F, and L. Bipolar, this is not a psychiatric diagnosis. It's an orientation of the EKG. And then we get the chest leads. And Wilson had the idea that you can't really get a picture of the electrical activation of the heart just looking at it in one plane. But we need a horizontal plane. So if you cut the chest horizontally, V1 is sitting up here on the right, above the right sternum. Then V2 on the other side, V3, V4, V5, V6 is in the axilla, mid-axillary line. Okay? So you know the right ventricle is in front. So we're going to detect right ventricular forces, especially with lead V1. 
Conversely, the left ventricle is lateral. So if you're in a lead over here in the axilla like V6, then your view is going to be dominated by what's happening with the left ventricle. And this begins to give you the idea that if you have something funny affecting your right ventricle, it might affect lead V1. And if there's something going on with your left ventricle, like it's hypertrophied, maybe you're going to see changes in V6. Okay? So these are the V leads brought to you by Frank Wilson. Now let's introduce the concept of axis. When we're measuring axis, we're thinking, what's the predominant direction of the electrical depolarization? And you could do an axis for atrial depolarization. You could do an axis for repolarization. But the axis that we really pay most attention to is the depolarization of the ventricles. That creates the most electrical energy on an EKG. And it has the most importance in terms of pathology. So when I talk to you about axis, I'm mainly talking about the depolarization of the right and left ventricle. And what's kind of the general direction of that? All right? So by convention, if you sum the depolarization energy of the right and left ventricle, and if it's mainly straight out to my left, we're going to call that zero. That's, that's zero axis. And if I move down, then we're going to go to 30 degrees, 60 degrees. If the forces are straight down, that's 90 degrees. That's facing Texas, right? And if it's way over here, minus 150, we're thinking Seattle, Washington. That's an extreme axis shift. OK? Now, yours and my normal QRS axis is basically from Nova Scotia to Texas, minus 30 to 90. That's the normal orientation of the sum of the QRS depolarization of the ventricles. Normal axis is from minus 30 to plus 90. You see axis way over here. Well, that's interesting. That might be a right ventricle problem. Maybe the right ventricle is dominating and pushing things to the right. If you see an axis way up here, it might be a left ventricle problem. OK? So that's the concept of axis. So, so far, we've talked about the magnitude and directionality of electrical activities. You must remember. Key principles, electrical force directed at a positive pole generates an upward deflection. Forces directed away from a positive pole give you a, now, a downward direction. Now, the magnitude of the deflection reflects how parallel the electrical force is to the lead. I'm going to show you an example of that in a minute. Forces that are directed perpendicular to a lead, you can't see them. If you're out here, and the forces are going not towards you or away from you, but straight up and down, you're not going to see them. It's like they're invisible. OK, so here's lead one. The right arm is the negative pole. The left arm is the positive pole. We're looking at this. Here, the depolarization of the two ventricles is creating a deflection of this, this vector, OK? And if you're watching this sum of depolarization energy from this orientation, you see a pretty big positive deflection. It comes towards you for a while, then of course it stops, and you drop back to zero. The ventricles have depolarized, right? You're out here. Depolarization's coming towards you. You see a big positive wave. Starts at baseline, goes up, comes down, back to baseline. Now, if you were in a different orientation, watching this from a different angle, it might look different. For instance, if you were looking at it, let's say you're in the same lead, but you have a 
vector that's down. It's not, it's not parallel to you, but it's a little bit angled down. Then the size of this deflection <coughs> is less. So this vector is less than this one because the directionality is not so directly at you. Make sense? So the size of the positive deflection has something to do not only with the amount of energy, but also how you're oriented in looking at it. Right? And if it's straight down, and this is your lead, you're out here looking for action, and there's no movement to or away from you, you just see a flat line. OK? Great. If you're looking at lead one and the forces are away from you, then it's a negative wave, right? The, the ventricles are depolarizing. Must be a tremendous amount of right ventricular hypertrophy here because the main forces are going away, and you're recording that as a negative deflection. Depolarization, away from your orientation, a negative deflection on the EKG. <laughs> And if you look at the QRS, this is the activity of depolarization of the two ventricles. Of course, that is the electrical signal for the mechanical activation of the two ventricles, isn't it? And we see all kinds of shapes and sizes. By convention, the first wave that you see the first deflection that's downward, we're going to call it a Q wave. I have no idea what their fixation was with Q. But that's it. Maybe they were James Bond friends. You know, I don't know. So the first negative deflection is a Q. The first positive deflection in a QRS complex is called an R wave. Okay? If there's if the first deflection is positive, then the, 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 the next downward deflection is called an S wave. So here's a QRS representation of ventricular depolarization. Here's an RS. Sometimes all we see is an R wave. Sometimes all we see is a negative deflection. We don't know if it's Q or a S, so we call it a QS. Sometimes we see this. R wave, then there's an S wave, then there's another R wave. This is called RSR prime. So when you look at the electrical depolarization of the ventricles in different orientation leads, it looks different. And it may look straightforward like these, or it may actually have hiccups in it because things are moving in different directions. We're going to get to that in a minute. All right, have I completely lost you by now? No. The why questions here are tough because this was invented 100 years ago. The nomenclature and conventions have stood the test of time. This is, this is what you're going to be dealing with when you read EKGs. All right, so let's pause for a second. Yes, sir. They could be. They could be pathological or they may not be. Okay? That's what I'm going to try to teach you. But the point is, they could be normal. They could be normal. Most typically, if you see a deep QS wave in certain leads, you're thinking that it's an old heart attack. Okay? And if you see an RSR prime, that's more than three boxes wide, four boxes wide. That's called right bundle branch block. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. So there are certain patterns that are more likely to be pathologic. But you could see this in a normal activation. If we took all of your EKGs and put them up on the board and say, OK, let's look at lead one, you'd see amazing variation. OK? Amazing variation. OK, so where's your pacemaker? Thankfully, you all have 
a pacemaker, and most likely it's your sinoatrial node residing in the right atrium, which has the inherent ability to figure out when it's supposed to naturally depolarize to keep you awake during this lecture after a meal. Okay? After the sinoatrial node activates, something has to happen. It's two things. The first thing is we have to activate the atria so they know they're supposed to contract, right? But we also need to concoct a delay so the ventricles have time to fill. So the sinoatrial node does its thing, and then the impulse in the atria goes through the atrial tissue into the AV node, the bundle of Hiss. During this period of time, the atria are contracting there's enough delay that the ventricles are now ready. And then the impulse goes to the bundle of Hiss and into three bundles that, see, that serve the ventricles. The left bundle branch has a posterior division and an anterior division, and the right bundle feeds the right ventricle. From here on, the activation is extremely rapid. In fact, if you look at a cardiac contraction, you really can't tell there's any delay of activation here versus here. But up here, we need time for atrial activation and squeeze. And then the ventricles have received, and they're ready to go. And the AV node is delayed to allow that to happen, right? The AV node is a source of delay so that the ventricles are fully fed and ready to contract. So sinoatrial node, AV node, the bundle of Hiss, and then the left bundles and the right bundle. So when I talk about an EKG that shows a right bundle branch block, it's referring to the fact that something's wrong with the electrical activation of the right ventricle. And you'll see a delay on the EKG that reflects it. Similarly, you'll want to be familiar with causes of left bundle branch block because they're very important as well. Typically, they signify left heart muscle disease of various kinds. Now, the EKG equivalent here is shown on the bottom. So now we're getting into the complete electrogram of each beat that you have. So here's the sinoatrial node doing its thing. The P wave represents electrical excitation and mechanical action. Three is the bundle of Hiss and AV node. And then four is when the, the ventricles are being depolarized. And then the T wave is when, it, when the, particularly the ventricles are recovering. Okay. The T wave represents recovery. So you're polarized, you get depolarized, and you repolarize during the T wave. Okay. Is it still working? Did this go off? Uh, well, it's off. Did the battery change? Battery change? Okay. I ran out of battery. Okay. Test, test. So this one's working, right? It says red, but you can hear me? Good. So any questions about the normal activation of your heart? It's pretty remarkable. I don't, I don't know many, how many beats in a lifetime, but there's a lot. There's a lot. Some people think that um, you only have so many beats in a lifetime. You ever heard that theory? It's, it's sort of 
sort of interesting. I've had people who don't like to exercise say to me, well, that's, that's why I don't exercise. I don't want to lose any extra heartbeats that I might need later on, right? And what's your answer to that? People who run, uh, on average, do live longer, right? So why is that? I mean, if they have a limited number of heartbeats and they use them up running, why do they live longer? So they lower their resting heart rate, and so they save heartbeats. I, I feel better already. <laughs> they also change the physiology of the coronaries and the ventricle and the brain and so forth. Um, so that's probably why. But I think the, the lifespan of a mouse in beats is similar to the lifespan of a human. And same with, what's the, what's the heart rate of an elephant? Ever seen, huh? Yeah, but you have a real question. Okay, good. So the, the P wave here is the electrical equivalent of atrial contraction. Okay? I don't know how I got on mice and elephants, but it was a lot of fun. Um, okay. So the average heart rate of an elephant, they live a long time, don't they? It's, it's probably a little heart rate. What's the recovery? It's, it is a low heart rate. There is, but it's so minuscule oh, right. that the size of the deflection, it's, it gets lost in the QRS. So there is, there is recovery, has to be, but you don't see it. It's, it's very minimal. Yes? Uh, why does she pick her depolarization? Um, depolarization happens very quickly, and the ion channels that shape repolarization are kind of, you know, pulling it back to its resting state. Okay, it's like pulling back a rubber band, right? So when you release it, boom, but when you repolarize it, and it's, it's got to be that way in order for everything to get reset, okay? And, of course, it's mindful of the fact that this is also generating a mechanical opportunity. Okay, it, it takes your ventricles a period of time to relax and, and enjoy the next amount of blood from the atria. What gets robbed when you exercise, systole or diastole? You can't rob systole. It, your heart takes a certain amount of time to contract. You can't reduce it. It's not possible. So when you run, what gets, what gets robbed is diastole, the filling time. Okay, and so some arrhythmias come because there's not adequate electrical recovery, and then you get all sorts of things which you're going to learn about. Well, that was fun. So now let's let's yeah, yes sir. I'm sorry. The heart rate is 30. Yeah, it's it's 30 to 50. It's 30 to 50. I and actually. You know, I expect one of you to bring in an EKG of an elephant so I can look at it, okay? Because I'd like to see one. EKG on a giraffe? Serious EKG. <laughs> Blood pressure on a giraffe? Well, it's like 700 over 50 because you've got to generate tremendous forces to get up to the ceiling. It's amazing. I don't know how I'm getting off track here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Biology 103. So let's imagine, um, this is going to be a simplistic way of thinking about the depolarization of the left and right ventricle, okay? So we're going to imagine that they're sort of functioning like a single cell. So here's the left ventricle, here's the right ventricle, here's the septum, okay? And here we are looking at this in AVF, and here we are in this lead AVL up here. So we're going to watch how the ventricles depolarize. This is very important for how the QRS looks, because the QRS complex is the electrical picture of the depolarization of the right and left ventricle. All right. So here we are. We're polarized, right? Negative forces inside, positive. All the membranes are polarized. We're ready 
to become depolarized. Now what happens? Well, interesting. The bundle that feeds the left side of the septum <coughs> kicks in first. So if somebody said, well, when the, when the ventricles depolarize, who gets it first? It's the left side of the septum. So this early, this early electrical force is going from left to right and down. So if we're in AVF, we're looking at this and there's, there's some positive movement toward us. The vector's coming down our way. We're going to record a positive deflection on the EKG. However, if I'm up here in AVL watching this, I'm seeing a negative force. It's going away from me. So I have a little negative deflection. You see that? So here I'm polarized and now I'm beginning to depolarize. AVL, AVF I'm seeing a positive wave, AVL it's negative. Then as the septum is depolarized, the apex of the heart, right ventricle, left ventricle is depolarizing. And at this moment, AVF is still seeing mainly forces coming down toward me. I'm watching this, this electrical activity is coming my way. I'm going to reflect a positive EKG force. AVL, as it starts to swing around toward AVL, when the left ventricle begins to move this way, it's going to come above the baseline. You see here, it was originally negative. Over here was negative. And now this vector is swinging around, and I'm going to see some positive forces. So this introduces the concept. There's the directionality of the QRS changes during activation of the two ventricles, right? And now, as it comes to the finish, if I'm down here in F, for a while, the vector was coming toward me, and I was recording positive waves. Then it went to being perfectly perpendicular, and now it's going away from me, and now I'm going to record negative forces. Whereas up here in AVL, it was originally negative, but now everything's coming toward me. And then it finishes completely depolarized, and I'm back to baseline. Okay? I'm back to baseline. So you see that the QRS complex looks different depending on where you're looking from. Here's an R, S wave. Here's a Q, R wave. Right? Yes, sir. Frame D, it's it's moving up, and then in frame E, it's finished. Right? It's still this QRS complex is finishing in the left ventricle. The right ventricle's done and the vector is being dominated by the left ventricle. And I'm recording that with continued positive wave here until the whole thing's depolarized. Then I go back to the resting state. It's depolarized now. Okay? So the late forces here are being dominated by the left ventricle. The very earliest force was dominated by the septum left to right. Okay? All right, now here are the V-leads. So we've sliced, we've sliced perpendicular. V1 is right up here, second inner space next to the sternum. V6, mid-axillary line, fourth inner space probably. And so we're going to watch what happens to the electrical forces from these different leads. I told you that the ventricle starts by depolarizing in the septum left toward right. So here it is. If I'm in V1, this early act activity is coming toward me. I'm going to be a positive. I'm going to record a positive wave. If I'm over here in V6, it's actually moving away from me. So I'm going to record that as a negative deflection. Okay. Then it starts to shift, affecting the apex and what was positive now is going to start moving away from V1. It's going to be more negative, and you can bet it's going to be even more negative when it shifts up here. And V6 was looking negative at first because of the left to right septum, but
But now it's going to swing up toward me, and we're going to see a positive R wave in V6. So this is the different orientation of what the depolarization looks like from the V leads, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, okay? So now it's coming hard to finish tall R wave, Q R wave in V6, and now we're seeing this was an R wave, so this is an S wave in V1. And when the whole thing is depolarized, back to the resting state, here was the early depolarization of the septum, and then mainly negative depolarization, V1, big, big S wave. This was due to the early depolarization, was an S wave, I'm sorry, a Q wave, and then an R wave. So now you can see that we can look at the QRS, its directionality, and its pattern from 12 different EKG leads, right? Bipolar, unipolar, chest leads. If you want, you could do leads in the back. You could do leads in the back. Sometimes we'll do V leads across the right side. We do that when we're looking for right ventricular infarction, when, we're, when, the, when the right heart muscle is hurt with a heart attack. You may be putting a, a chest leads on the right side next year to look for a right ventricle infarction that's not well seen on the left. You can have as many leads as you want, but a standard EKG uses 12 leads. And here's what the QRS looks like if you go from V1 to V6. I showed you V1 and V2 before, but each of these as you move from the right toward the left, you see more positive forces here, simply reflecting that the left ventricle has more energy. It's got more mass, and it has more electrical power, if you will, and you see that on an EKG. Right ventricle less, left ventricle more. When the R wave and the S wave are equal, we call that the transition lead, the transition lead. And for most people, either in V3 or V4, we're seeing roughly the same amount of voltage, positive and negative. This is important because you're going to see patients where essentially there's no R wave at all until you get out to V4. It's just all QS waves. The reason for that is typically there's been a heart attack and the R waves have been knocked out by dead tissue. You see a QS pattern in V1 through V3. That's an old anterior wall heart attack most typically. We're going to learn more about that tomorrow. Okay. So now let's move to EKG interpretation. Now, thankfully, you don't have to do all this stuff. You have EKG techs and fancy machines. They're not going to ask you to check the calibration. Back 100 years ago when I was a student, we had to hook the people up. We did a single lead EKG, and we had to cut them up and put them on a piece of paper. It was a lot of busy work. But now there's more knowledge, so you have to do the smart stuff, and you have other people to help you do that stuff. So they're going to check the calibration for you. You want to look at the heart rhythm. We're going to talk a lot about heart rhythm. I want to teach you how to calculate the heart rate, okay? Then we'll look at intervals. We touched on this a minute ago. And then we'll talk about the axis. We'll talk about the P waves and the QRS complexes. And then we'll finish with STT changes, okay? So here we go. Um, the paper speed on an EKG machine is uh, 25 mm per second, OK? So five of these little boxes is 0.2 seconds, right? If you look at voltage, each of these little boxes is a millivolt, a 0.1 millivolts. So five of them is 0.5 millivolts. We're measuring small electrical energy here small electrical energy to drive a big pump, all right? By convention, 
from wherever the P wave starts until wherever the QRS starts. We're going to call that the PR interval. Okay? That interval is important because it has to be long enough for the ventricles to fill. If it's too long, the ventricles are sitting there like, you beat already, give me the signal. And if it's really a long time, uh, if there's no, no communication at all, then the ventricle decides what it wants to do and it beats on its own. The ventricles are capable of being a pacemaker, but they're not very good. They typically go too slow and you feel rotten. Heart rate of 30, can't pay attention to Dr. Eagle because I got about half as many heartbeats per minute as, as I need. Okay? This is the PR interval. The duration of the depolarization of the ventricles is called the QRS complex. There it is, the QRS interval right there. So PR interval, QRS interval, and then from the start of the QRS until the end of the T wave, this is called the QT interval. But we want to actually measure the PR interval, the QRS interval, and the QT interval. They're all important. And they all have pathologic states that can change them. Okay? What could give you a short PR interval? Well, if you had a bypass tract where instead of using the AV node, you were born with, a, with an electrical circuit that directly connected the region of the sinus node to the ventricles, then you might have a very short PR interval. Interesting. That's called, well, as an interesting aside, um, people who have a short PR interval, are we okay? Okay, good. Um, if you start throwing at me, I'm going to, you know, anyway. Short PR interval caused by an extra circuit that you might have between your sinus node area and the ventricles, then the, the ventricles get activated a little too quick. What's interesting, people who have that can get re-entrant arrhythmias where they go really fast. Uh, around 1920, there's this doctor in Boston named Paul Dudley White. And one of the heavyweight rowers at Yale was having an interesting problem. He would get into the race, and then his heart would just take off. And nobody in New Haven seemed to know what to do. So he went up to see the great Paul Dudley White. And he looked at his EKG, and he had a short PR interval. It was about 0 0.10. And he had talked to his friend Parkinson from England, and he had two cases, same thing, young people with tachycardias. And the fellow who was investigating this case was named Wolf. So they decided that let's name something after ourselves. We'll call it the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, WPW. And it's people who are born with an extra circuit between the atria and the ventricles, and they can get dangerous tachycardias, WPW, and not, currently what we do for that is we find the circuit with electrical wires and we zap it with radio frequency energy. It's 99% curable now. But it killed a lot of people before we figured out A, what it was, B, how to handle it. So short PR interval, you think about somebody with a bypass trap. These intervals are important. You're going to be measuring them on the EKGs and you're going to be commenting when there's a problem. What's the normal heart rate for an adult? Well, it's going to be 60 to 100. Uh, the runners in the room, you're probably in the 50s. If any of you are big time swimmers, you may be in the 40s. The people in my practice with the slowest heart rates are the swimmers. They are saving their heartbeats for a later day. Um, they have an amazingly slow heart rate. I don't know what Michael Phelps' heart rate is. I'd love to know. Jim Ryan, when he ran the mile in 352, you know what his resting heart rate was? Like an elephant, 32. Real slow. Amazing. And the more you run, the lower your resting heart rate. 
to a certain level. You know, it's not going to go to zero. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm glad you got that. Okay, so how do we measure heart rate? Well, you could do it several ways. You could know that the um, um, standard paper speed is 25 millimeters per second. So if you counted the number of millimeters between two QRS complexes, that's between two beats, you could do this. Heart rate equals 25 millimeters per second times 60 seconds per minute divided by the number of millimeters between beats. 1,500 divided by this would give you a heart rate, 65. That's, um, now that takes a while, you know, taking 1,500 and dividing it by the number of boxes. So here's another way. You could simply know that if the two QRS complexes are separated by five, box, uh, five boxes, the heart rate's 300. And five boxes, the heart rate is 60. So each of these represents a decrement, 300, 150, 70, 175, 60. So if you know that the thing starts here and it's sort of halfway between 75 and 60, you call it 67. For a regular rhythm, that's usually what you do. You'll get so comfortable with looking at these numbers that so you say, oh, his heart rate's about three boxes and beating about 100. It's about 100. Sometimes the heart rate is irregular, so it's useful to actually use a different method, and that is count 15 boxes is three seconds. So let's see, uh, five, 10, 15. So there's three seconds. And during this three seconds, I have one, two, three, four, five beats. So five times 20, oh, six beats, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, six. Six times 20, 120. Right, so three seconds times 20, that's 60 seconds worth, that's per minute. So this, this AFib rate is about 120 beats per minute. If it's irregular, you want to just count 15 boxes and multiply that number, the number of QRS complexes, by 20. Three different ways you can calculate the heart rate. Your heart rate, um, you're nice and relaxed right now, probably 60, 65. Mine's going up a little because I'm lost. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's, uh, it's settled down. All right, now let's talk about the intervals. PR interval, the normal is three to five boxes, 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. If it's shorter than that, pre-excitation, what that usually means is an extra circuit like Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, WPW. I think on the test, there might be a bonus question on a rower with a short PR interval and tachycardia. I can't remember, but I think there might be. Um, now, there's other things that can happen. You can get a short PR interval if instead of the sinoatrial node running the business, there's a place lower down in the atrium. Right? So if, if for some reason you have a pacemaker just above the bundle or the AV node that says, I want to take over, if it rules, then the PR interval might be shorter. This can be right at the AV junction. We call that a junctional rhythm. The PR interval can be increased. So if instead of 0.2, if it's 0.24, we call that first degree AV block. Usually means there's something wrong in the atria. Maybe it's fibrosing as you age. Sometimes it just fibrosis and eventually they don't talk to each other. And then you need a pacemaker because the ventricular escape pacemaker is too slow. Patients feel poorly. So first degree AV block would be a longer than 0.20 PR interval. The QRS complex. Normally it's pretty narrow, less than 0.10 seconds. That's less than or equal to two and a half of those little boxes. Okay? That would be a normal interval. It's never decreased that I've seen. But it can be increased with several things. I talked to you about if the left bundle is not working or the right bundle isn't working, it may be prolonged. If a patient has a ventricular ectopic beat in the left ventricle, 
the right ventricle takes a while to depolarize and it looks long. It's wide. That QRS complex is wide. <laughs> Toxic drug effects like quinidine or elevation in your potassium can cause a lengthening of the QRS. And eventually death if it stops actually functioning with any reasonable normalcy. The QT interval from the start of the QRS to the end of the repolarization T wave, right? The QT interval can be short in hypercalcemia or tachycardia. And it can be long in a bunch of things. You've got to know these. These are important. Low calcium, low potassium, low magnesium, all of them can cause a long QT syndrome. There are patients who are having a threatened heart attack where the QT is prolonged. Some patients have inherent genetic defects that foul up ion channels that make the QT interval too long. Congenital QT syndromes, high likelihood of sudden death. And I believe Dr. Lehman will be teaching you about those later. If you take a history, you got a medical student comes, comes in and says, you know, I had three of my siblings drop dead. First thing I'm looking for is the QT interval on his EKG or her EKG. So prolonged QT can be an inherited phenomenon. And then there are other there are drugs that can do this, like quinidine and other antiarrhythmic drugs can prolong the QT. The, the, the mechanism of death in heart attacks, ventricular fibrillation, not infrequently, the QT interval is prolonged. And then there's a premature ventricular contraction that hits the ventricles at a very vulnerable moment and triggers ventricular tachycardia, which is just too fast, 250 beats a minute, and then it degenerates to V-fib. Yes, sir? Yes. Yes, they are. But I just, we've just talked about the fact that that can be caused by structural problems, toxic effects metabolically, drugs, or inherited conditions, or an acute infarct, uh, myocardial infarction. Okay, so you're going to see this kind of stuff on your quiz for sure. And uh, you're going to learn about Paul Dudley White, too. Um, what about this axis thing? So. I just told you that the normal QRS axis on the planar view, up and down, is going to be from minus 30 to 90, straight down, right? That's zero, minus 30, Texas is straight down 90. If it's more to my right, then that's going to be called a right axis. Anything beyond 90 degrees, it's going to be a right axis. Anything more negative than 30 is going to be called a left axis, okay? By convention, if it's less than 30, between minus 45 and 30, we call it left axis deviation. If it's even more left than that, we call it left anterior hemiblock. It implies that one of the branches of the left bundle is very weak. So less than minus 45, left anterior hemiblock. From 30 to minus 45, left axis deviation. The right axis, it's just more or less extreme. Okay? What might give you a right axis? Well, if the right ventricle is unusually hypertrophied, then the right-sided forces may have a bigger role. And the QRS, accordingly, is more dramatic for the right ventricle, and the axis moves to the right. So we're going to see that in conditions like pulmonary hypertension. OK, what about the atrial abnormalities? Uh, typically, you're going to look at lead 2 and lead V1 to look at what's happening with the depolarization of the atria. That's the P wave. One of you said, well, what's the P wave? That's the depolarization of the atria, okay? Here's normal, and these are happening almost simultaneously. You see the right atrium's a little sooner because of the pacemaker location, but when you see the paper, it looks like this. V1, 
looks a little bit like that. Pretty, pretty innocuous looking little wave, isn't it? The P wave has fairly low voltage, so you're not struck by it. If the right atrium is enlarged, then in lead two, we're going to see more voltage. And in V1, we see the right atrium as a positive wave, and then the left atrium. If the left atrium is enlarged, <coughs> in lead two, we see more voltage and width. And in V1, particularly, we see a fairly deep negative wave from left atrial depolarization. So you will see abnormalities of the P waves. They're not nearly as good as echocardiography for identifying enlargement or hypertrophy. But these, these are important electrical phenomena for you to recognize. What about patients who have rheumatic fever? Rheumatic fever. A lot of times, people with rheumatic fever end up with rheumatic heart disease. I think you learned about this probably, right? Aortic valve disease, mitral valve disease, maybe pulmonic valve disease. If both of their P waves are enlarged, right atrium's big, left atrium's big, you get sort of a, a camel hump in lead two. Looks a little like this, except the left atrium is also big. Looks like a camel hump. We call that P mitrality, because we tend to see it in patients with rheumatic heart disease who have big left and right atria. Okay. The concept of hypertrophy. If the right ventricle is hypertrophied, then the electrical contribution to the QRS is increased. More muscle, more electrical activation measured by EKG. I told you earlier that typically the right ventricle is thinner, and electrically it's less contributing to the QRS complex. But if the right ventricle is hypertrophied, then you may see right ventricular forces that surprise you. Here's an example of that. Here we, we're in V1. And remember, the depolarization is first left to right in the septum, but you've got a relatively thin left ventricle compared to this huge right ventricle. So V1 is mainly looking at positive forces. And lead V6 out here is quite a lot of negative force. Because in this case, the right ventricle electrically is dominating the show. OK? So RVH, the R wave is greater than the S wave in V1. And usually we see right axis deviation. Make sense? You might see right ventricular hypertrophy from uh, a VSD or pulmonary hypertension, or some other disorder of the right ventricle. Pulmonic stenosis could give you that. Left ventricular hypertrophy, you see how hypertrophy this free wall is, and the septum. So you see the QRS is increased in size, and it's dominated by this late vector here. So. There's a tall S wave, here's R, tall S wave in V1. And R in V5 or V6 is 35 millimeters in height. Or the R wave in ADL is 11. Or the R in V1 is more than 15. These are what Lilly would like to use for the definition of LVH. There are several definitions. I don't want you to know so much which one is, they're all reasonable. What's important is that you recognize that, that high voltage out here in the QRS is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. OK, yes? Yeah, we're going to, I think we're going to talk about that in a minute. OK? If we don't, we'll come back to it. All right. 
earlier I talked to you about the concept of, are we okay for time? Are you, I'm thinking that we'll just charge on and I'll finish a little early instead of giving you a break. Are you okay with that? I mean, if you're getting a clot or something, please stand up. Um, okay. So I talked to you early about the concept of block in either the right bundle or left bundle. And here's what that could look like. Um, here's a patient who has a uh, right bundle branch block. Uh, the initial forces, here's V1, right? V1, V6. So we're going to measure left and right bundle branch block looking at the V leads. Okay? That's where you look. And in V1, the first forces are down and to the left towards you, right? So we have a positive deflection. And then things start to move away. And it's interesting, there's block with the right bundle here, so there's a long period of time here where we're not seeing anything. There are no forces moving into the right ventricle because it's blocked. So everything's moving leftward. In V1, we're going down, down. In V6, we're moving up, up. And then very late, finally, there's a little energy coming to the right ventricle set. Oh, by the way, you should beat now. There's right bundle branch block. So there's a late positive force. And in V1, it gives you this characteristic RSR prime. It's wider than 0.10. And it's RSR prime. Up here in V6, we see some late negative forces. There's a, that's a Q wave, so this is an S wave, QRS. There's a late S wave in V6, but we recognize right bundle branch block looking at V1, RSR prime. And it's the late R prime that is the late vector coming in after a period of delay caused by the block. Okay, that's a right bundle branch block. Left bundle branch block is interesting, and it's because the left bundle is blocked, the first forces aren't along the left side of the septum. The first forces are coming along the right side of the septum. So if I'm in V1, I'm used to seeing stuff coming down toward me. That'd be a positive way, but in this case, it's negative. And things are coming, they're coming. Now it starts to come down toward me in V1, and then, um, and it's going to finish strong away, finally coming back to baseline. Look at V6. V6, normally this first thing is going to be going away from me, but it's not. There's a left bundle branch block. It's looking, everything is toward me here. Then, it's, then it starts to go down, and then late it comes hard again positive. We get this wide QRS in V6. Again, the R prime here is this late vector. So V6 is mainly upright and wide. V1 is mainly negative and down. Okay? This is the concept of a left bundle branch block. And you especially look at it in V1, all negative and wide. V6, positive and wide. Left bundle branch block, right bundle branch block. When the left ventricle is damaged, you typically are going to see a left bundle branch block. You're going to see patients next year with bad cardiomyopathies. Their left ventricular ejection fraction is not like your 55 to 60, but it's 20. And when you look at the EKG, you're going to notice, geez, the voltages here are wide and tall. Left bundle branch block, it's very common in cardiomyopathies. Conversely, you're going to see patients with pulmonary hypertension and huge right ventricles that might be infarcted, you may see a right bundle branch block in a patient like that. All right, so any questions before we wade into the topic of coronary heart disease manifesting itself on the surface electrocardiogram? Yes, sir. Way back? Here.
Yeah, the, the, the way the um, ion channels work, if you're hyper, uh, if you're hypercalcemic, your QT interval actually shortens. You recover quicker. But for all of the rest of these, the, the systemic state of a, low, of a low ion like that causes delays in the repolarization process. And the QT interval is prolonged. And what's very important is that during the period where the heart is repolarizing, if a stimulus comes in the midst of that, it's vulnerable to create a reentrant tachycardia. So if you, if you happen to fire a PVC from someplace in the ventricle when it's trying to recover, if it hits at a vulnerable moment, it can trigger a reentrant tachycardia. Long QT interval, like these conditions, and PVCs don't go well together. If you happen to hit the heart during an early recovery, it can then go ahead and generate a uh, circus rhythm where it just goes 300 beats a minute. Not supportable. Can't live like that. Okay. Now, this, this is probably going to be um, the most difficult part of my moments with you today, is understanding this. It's actually fascinating to think that over 100 years after the electrocardiogram was created, it remains the single most important test early in the course of a patient's treatment for acute myocardial infarction. An electrical phenomenon determines therapeutic strategy. It's, I still am completely mystified by it. I have no idea. Maybe someday I'll understand. But I don't get it. But it's true. We're going to talk about the EKG of myocardial infarction, ST elevation and non-ST elevation, how we localize heart attacks, how the changes evolve, and then the concept of Q waves, okay? About uh, 15 slides to glory here. Then you'll be out of here. I'll have you perfectly tenderized for tomorrow. All right. So the first thing, the concept of a transmural MI or ST elevation MI. Here, you're, you're familiar now with this. Here's the right ventricle, septum, left ventricle. Here is a heart muscle that has suffered transmural ischemia. The full thickness of the heart muscle is damaged. Therefore, the cells of that heart muscle are not able to maintain a polarized state. They're leaking. They're electrically in deep trouble. They're mechanically probably not moving. And if you're looking at this electrical activity from this point of view, the cells look like they're depolarizing, and they are. But the cells closest to you are dominating your vision. You, these cells on the surface, there's, you're sensing electrical activity away from you. In fact, all of the cells are leaking. And there is a depolarization process happening throughout this heart muscle. But the part that you can see closest to your view looks like there's a vector away. Looks like there's a force going away from you. It's essentially a bleeding off of polarity, I suppose. That's an, that's an original egoism. I'm sure you'll not find it in any textbook or learned piece of work. But there's this bleeding off, and you're, you're looking at this, and you're like, oh, uh, there's electrical activity here. And normally, the baseline would be like this, but because of this ion movement, here's the baseline that you're actually recording with your EKG machine. The baseline has been shifted down. Then what happens when this ventricle gets depolarized? Here's the QRS complex. It comes back 
to the normal baseline, and then it comes back, it, it falls back down to this downward shifted baseline. This, this distance here, this is called ST elevation. This is the T wave, this is the QRS axis. Here's the ST area, and you see it's elevated in this. Should be down here, but it's not. It's elevated and it comes on down. ST elevation in the presence of chest pain is a mandate to go to the cath lab or give a clot busting drug because patients who have that typically have an occluded artery, they're having a heart attack most often, and you want to open it. And if you open it, the ST segment elevation goes away and you have a chance to salvage at least some of the heart muscle that's being injured. Maybe not all of it, but some of it. This is the electrical reason for ST elevation, okay? Now, so this would be called an ST elevation MI. We don't use the term transmural and non-transmural much now anymore. We say ST elevation or non-ST elevation, and this is the ST elevation, yes? Well, it's actually not coming towards you. It's going away. If you look at the sum, the sum of electrical activity here, it can't come towards you. There are no cells to transmit it. So, so you're sensing ion movement away from you, and that shifts the baseline downward. Okay? And you're right. If, if this area is also being depolarized, it should be neutral, but because this dominates your view with such little amounts of activity, you shift this baseline downward, okay? There's no cells here to come towards you, and these are dominating the picture. All right, ST elevation. Here it is. That's ST elevation. And typically in heart attacks, it looks like this. It's convex. It's either, it comes across straight or it actually looks like a tombstone, right? Have you ever heard of tombstones on the EKG? That is an ST segment elevation that looks like a tombstone here, okay? Sometimes you can have ST elevation and it's actually convex or, con yeah, con not convex but concave, and it's not from a heart attack, it's from pericarditis or other things. But I want you to understand the principle about ST segment elevation and this is what it is. Now here's the non-ST segment elevation. Here's a patient who's having a heart attack. The cells that are being damaged are the furthest away from the blood supply. Where's that? That's in the subendocardium, right? Don't the coronaries, they run along the epicardium and then they dive into the myocardium and eventually they serve the muscle in the subendocardium, right? There it is. So this segment, the whole wall is not injured. The inner half is damaged. It's having a hard time maintaining polarity. As a consequence, there is a small but steady vector of electrical forces coming toward this electrode. It shifts the baseline up. So here's the new baseline, here's the QRS, it will go back to its normal baseline and then it finds its way back to the new baseline. Here's ST segment depression. In this case, the ST segment here is below the PR segment. In the last case, the ST segment is above the PR segment. Got it? So this is called ST depression or a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. You don't know if it's infarcted until you get protein measurement, right? You're going to talk about that tomorrow. We measure troponins or CPK and find out if myocardial cells have actually died. You can get ST depression without cell death. That's what we do stress testing for. 
we take you and we run you for 30 minutes on a treadmill and see if we can make your ST segments depress. That suggests subendocardial ischemia. Isn't that interesting? We're trying to make your EKG show ST depression on a stress test, suggesting there's a problem with blood supply to that inner part of the heart muscle. So these are important, ST elevation, non-ST elevation. Now, how do we localize MIs? Well, we're going to, by convention, heart attacks that are changing the leads in V1 through V6, we're going to call them anterior. If it's like V5, V6, 1, and L, we're going to call those anterolateral. Uh, if it's just down here in V3 and V4, anteroapical. If it involves the back of the heart, then we see tall R waves in V1 and V2. If the leads that are looking at EKGs down here, uh, leads 2, 3, and AVF are the downward leads. If we see the changes there, we'll call it an inferior wall heart attack. If it's just up here in V1 and V2, well, that's right over the septum, anterior wall septum. So by convention, where you see the ST elevation or the ST depression gives you some idea of how to localize the heart attack. And then conversely, you have some idea of which artery might be involved. Not always, but some idea. Okay, so we've, we've talked about the concept of ST elevation, ST depression, and now localizing those changes to one or more of the EKG leads. The point is, you usually don't see ST elevation in all the leads, and you don't see ST depression in all the leads. You see it in localized areas that are being injured. If you see it in all the leads, then you've got a really big problem. You know, I would suggest, perhaps, the right coronary artery is blocked, and the left coronary artery in the left main is in jeopardy, and all the leads are saying, I'm trying to die. Just like you're feeling 90 minutes into an EKG lecture. <laughs> but your cells are still working, and we're charging onward. So inferior wall, 2, 3, and F. Usually, it's the right coronary artery feeding this area. The septal leads, V1 and V2 up here, usually it's the left anterior descending artery. V3, V4, usually a LAD. Anterolateral, 1 and L. Here, here, it's usually the circumflex, the left circumflex. And the apex... Well, you know, the apex of the heart is going to, it's the last to get its blood supply. So it could be any of the three. Depends on what's dominant. If you've got a dominant LAD, then an apical infarct may be a distal LAD lesion. So it can be any of the three affecting just V5 and V6 out here. So we've introduced the concept of ST elevation, non ST elevation, localization. And now this idea that, in some ways, the EKG may give me a hint. Which artery is involved here? Somebody's going to come in with tombstones. That's ST elevation, V2 through V5. You're going to look at that in the ER and say, we've got to go to the cath lab. This patient's having an anterior wall myocardial infarction. I think the LAD is occluded. And most of the time, you're right. That's where it's at. What happens to these over time? Yes? Is there a reason why on the two previous slides the EKG needs to match the heart? Use these. Use these. I, sometimes I disagree with Lily. Use these. We won't try to trip you up. It reminds me of a quote um, that Jay Danforth Quayle once, once made. Remember Dan Quayle, anybody? Was, he was vice president, right? He said once, um, I have opinions, strong ones, that I don't always agree with. So this is my example of that. I have strong opinions, and I don't always agree with myself. But use these. They're in the book. And, you know, for the most part, there's overlap, but just use these. These are important, though. Inferior wall, right coronary. The V leads, typically LAD, 1 and L circumflex. Okay, that's important. You got to know the anterior wall, typically LAD, inferior wall, right coronary, lateral wall, <laughs> circumflex. Okay? 
Now what happens? Early on, here's the normal, QRS, T wave. And you see the PR interval and the ST segment have the same baseline. Here's a patient who's having an ST elevation MI. Here's the tombstone. It's convex. It's ST elevated. After some period of time, the typical evolution is that in the region of injury, Q waves begin to form because cells are dying. And the what would normally be positive electrical cells is being replaced by a vacuum. The cells are inert, they're dead. They're electrically inert. And you begin to see a Q wave. In this case, we have a Q wave forming. We sti still have ST elevation. And the R wave is no longer as tall. So cells that were used to be here are dead. And now we see a Q wave in their place. Okay. Later, we might see still ST elevation. Here's the Q wave. It's growing. That's not good. And the T wave is deepening. And later, we might end up with a Q wave, normal looking R wave, and the T wave is flipped over. And often later in life, we have a Q wave and a normal T wave. This whole evolution can happen in days or minutes. Days or minutes. You'll see a patient who's got this, and you turn around after you open them up, and they look like that. They end up with a little Q wave because you didn't get all. You didn't get all of the heart muscle that was going to be damaged by the heart attack. Typically, QS waves in leads that shouldn't have them indicate an old heart attack. Yes, sir? I think we're getting to that. Boy, you are asking timely questions. I didn't, I didn't pay him to do that, OK? So the concept of why this happens. Here, here we are. Here's a patient who's had a big anterior wall MI, OK? It's all knocked out. It's mechanically dead. And electrically, it's not going to contribute much to the QRS. Here's the original septum left to right depolarization. We're over here in AVL. And we see it's going away from us. There's a negative wave. Then we're going downward. Here's the apex. We're seeing a negative wave. And then as we go along, the right ventricle's being depolarized. Everything's negative. And then finally, thankfully late, part of the upper free wall is alive. We see a late R wave. So here's the pathologic Q wave. Normally, this would have been a very small little Q wave from septal depolarization. But now, everything's involving the right ventricle. The left ventricle is not doing well. And you see that by a Q wave there. OK? That's one example of why this occurs. Holy cow. I think that's the last slide. Let's take questions. Yes, ma'am. After a heart attack? So most patients, after an ischemic injury, the repolarization process results in a flipped T wave. I told you earlier that the repolarization usually happens. So, so you depolarize from proximal to distal, and you repolarize from distal back to proximal. When there's an injury, it fouls that up. The area of injury is a gamish. It's in all kinds of states of recovery. And it ends up often leading to either a flattened T wave or an inverted T wave. Not always, but most often. And usually with recovery, it'll gradually come back and be positive, but not always. Other questions? Is this understandable? You know, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go back to that. Let me, um, let me reset this. Huh? Well, this is fine. So <clears throat> when you look at a lead, 
normally if, you, if, if, if this lead is zero, and you know, say, uh, ADF is straight down, and the predominant forces are kind of halfway in between, you say, that's, it's about, no, that's 90, that's zero, it's 45. When, when you look at the limb leads, one, two, three, F, you'll get a sense for where's the most positive vector and you know that the axis is kind of in that direction. Really, the axis is a sum. It's actually not a single line. It's actually moving through, through systole. But by looking at the 12 individual electrograms, you get a feeling like, oh, there's a lot of positive forces directed out here in one, and it's negative. It's, it's, there's nothing going on in F. It's zero. So you look at the, particularly the limb leads, one, two, three, RLF, for those forces, and you'll get a sense for where that is. Okay? Yes? Is there any component of chest Yes, there is. And so um, many years ago, there was a field called vector cardiography that sort of tracked in three dimensions how the QRS axis would look. And now we use this echocardiography. Um, electrically, it's important for you to recognize extreme left axis or right axis. But beyond that, calculating the axis specifically is not that important. And the good news for you is the EKG machine does it for you. It's going to spit out the PR interval, the QRS interval, the QT interval, and the QRS axis. And you're going to have all of that information. It does the calculation for you. Okay. Um, other questions? So the email keagle at umich.edu. You can email me questions. It's fine. And if not, I look forward to teaching you about coronary disease tomorrow morning. Thank you.